morning. morning. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. O Lord our God, you are the maker of heaven and earth. And you have created this universe, and you uphold this universe by the word of your power. Lord, not only that, but you have also done a work in our hearts. You have regenerated us. You have given us new life when we were dead, and even now you sustain our lives spiritually. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to do that as we open up your word. For we know that you have used means of grace and order for your grace to be at work in our lives. And one of those means is the Word of God. And Lord, we recognize that it is so precious, it is sweeter than honey, um, it is the most tasteful and delightful thing that we can feed on. And so Lord, as we open up your Word, Lord, we ask that you would be merciful. God, that you would expose any sin in our own hearts and that it would be brought to bear, that it would be brought in the light, that we might turn against it and repent and have true contrition in our hearts. Lord, I thank you for each one here that's here today. I pray that you would richly bless them and that your word would be at work in all of our hearts and make us more like Christ and drive us to the one who is so worthy of all worship. Lord, you are so good and so magnificent. And I pray that you would be pleased um, as we seek to live our lives for you. God, the passage that we are about to look in is very weighty. And uh, Lord, I do not want to undermine what it says. And I do not want to say anything beyond what it means. And so Lord, I ask that you would help me to communicate your word accurately and in a compelling way that would drive us to Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our passage for this morning is Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 48. And today I have chosen to take a much lengthier section compared to the amount of verses I have preached on per <laughs> sermon up to this point in the Sermon on the Mount. And I've decided to take the rest of chapter 5 together because there is one major theme that can be traced throughout. Now I will not be able to go into as much detail on each of these sections as much as you might like me to, but that is okay because many of these truths are going to be reiterated and spoken about from different angles as we continue to make our way through the Gospel of Matthew. Now, the thrust of Jesus' teaching on the various topics found in chapter 5 has to do with Jesus upholding the law in contrast to those who accuse Jesus of abolishing the law. You see, Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 48, naturally follows and flows out of chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. And what we learned last week is essential for understanding what we are looking at this week. Last week we learned how Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets in two ways. First, he obeyed it perfectly, and second, he embodied the reality to which it pointed. And so Jesus' fulfillment of the law didn't get rid of it, but it did redirect the way we are to understand it and obey it in the context of the New Covenant. And if you want more of an explanation on that, you are going to have to go to our website and watch last week's sermon, because there's no way I can possibly go through all of that again. But for now, it is only important to underscore how Jesus was against anyone who relaxed the commandments of the Old Testament Scriptures. Now, in verses 17 through 20, Jesus spoke about people that really are on the inside of the kingdom, that really do live out the life of the kingdom, even though they have a false view of the Old Testament and end up relaxing the commandments therein. But there are also people who relax the commandments in the law that are on the outside of the kingdom. And they're on the outside of the kingdom because their righteousness is merely outward, and that's the main issue. 
according to Jesus, that was the problem with the scribes and Pharisees. You see, the irony about this is that those who were so meticulously preoccupied with upholding the law and even accused Jesus of not keeping it are those who actually didn't obey the law because they had unbelievably relaxed it. And how did they do that? Well, in Mark chapter 7, verse 8, it says that Jesus said to them, You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. The Pharisees were great at making a mountain out of a molehill while ignoring what was really important. You want to know what else the Pharisees were very good at? Eisegesis. And you want to know what they were terrible at? Exegesis. Eisegesis is wrongly interpreting God's Word and taking it out of context. Exegesis is to rightly interpret God's Word in its proper context. So really, the Pharisees were committed to God's Word with their lips only, but it was their traditions that had so enraptured their hearts, which caused them to twist, undermine, and misinterpret the Law and the Prophets. And so what is Jesus doing in verses 21 through 48? Well, He is reestablishing, He is upholding, and rightly interpreting the Law and the Prophets by showing the direction to which it had always pointed. And that is key for grasping what Jesus means in the six antitheses that follow. In this section, Jesus rightly interprets six different laws from the Old Testament that the Pharisees had so seriously mishandled, which were murder, adultery, divorce, oaths, retaliation, and love for one's enemies. And for each one of these topics, you will notice that he begins with saying, You have heard that it was said, but to those of old, and then Jesus repeats what was said, but then he goes on to say, But I say to you. Now these statements have generated a significant <laughs> amount of controversy. But to be quite honest, I don't particularly find them very difficult to comprehend. When Jesus says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, but I say to you, some people believe Jesus is showing his authority by amending the Old Testament law to introduce a new law. In other words, Jesus is abolishing the laws of the old by replacing it with a much more strict and heightened form of law. For example, William Barclay says, Jesus quotes the law only to contradict it and to substitute a teaching of his own. Well, I think Barclay is certainly wrong on this point. And there are two problems with this kind of thinking that I want to bring to your attention. The first problem with it is that Jesus has already affirmed that he did not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but that he came to fulfill them. And as we have seen, fulfillment cannot possibly mean that it was obliterated. And furthermore, Jesus' life of obedience didn't fulfill a lower standard of conduct, only for him to later give a higher standard of conduct. Now, the second problem with believing Jesus is replacing the law for a new code of ethics is that if that were the case, he would not have prefaced the antith or he would have prefaced the an antitheses differently. He would not have said, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Instead, he would have said, it is written, but I say to you. But given the fact that he doesn't, confirms that Jesus is not getting rid of those laws, but what he is doing is getting rid of what some people had said about those laws. And we can be certain, I think, of that because of what is stated in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. If you look at verse 43, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Is there any place in the Old Testament that you can think of that says, You shall hate your enemy? 
Well, to look for such a statement that bears even any amount of resemblance is to look in vain. And yet the people in Jesus' day had heard that that was said, not because the Old Testament said such a thing, but because the scribes and Pharisees had miscommunicated what the law had said because of their false interpretations of it. But where did they get such an idea? Well, it was probably based upon a false conclusion drawn from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, which reads, You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The rabbis were actually teaching that love for neighbor implied that it was okay to hate your enemy. They took this to mean that, you know, that you shouldn't bear a grudge against your own people, but with others, that's totally fine. It's okay. And friends, that's exactly what they did. That is the way that they treated the Samaritans and the Gentiles. It was with hatred, not love. But Jesus came along and said, You see those enemies of yours over there? You need to go and love them. Well, when Jesus said that, he wasn't introducing something new. He was correcting something they had so badly misunderstood. And this mishandling of the Word of God had serious ramifications. So in this section... Uh, on, in verses 21 through 48, Jesus is not rejecting Old Testament teaching, but only the oral rabbinic interpretations that had distorted it. Jesus is not contradicting Moses, but what he says is vastly different to what the scribes and Pharisees had said. The Pharisees majored on minors, and they minored on majors. They were legalistic about their obedience to their traditions, but liberal on their obedience to the demands of God. In reality, therefore, they were the ones relaxing what Jesus was upholding. And their false accusations and their baseless smears are going to be confronted head on and on so many levels, Jesus is going to show the intended meaning regarding what the Law and the Prophets had always demanded. And so let's begin making our way through these six subjects, beginning with anger. Please look at verses 21 and 22. It says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. The only thing the Pharisees taught concerning the sixth commandment was with respect to the physical act of killing someone. But there was nothing said about the demands that this law had on the heart. And so Jesus expounds upon it by showing that a person is guilty of murder before the act has even been committed. I mean, the anger of man, according to James, does not produce the righteousness of God. And murder first begins in a heart that is angry. Now, such anger may not be seen by men, but it is seen by God. Anger in the heart will not bring you before a human court in which that counsel can pronounce that you are guilty. But, although um, you may escape the judgment of a human counsel, you will not escape the court of God, according to Jesus, and His judgment is far greater. The worst sentence you can receive from a court of law is the death penalty. But that cannot be compared to the judgment of God that we are all liable to, which is the hell of fire. And what does it take to become subject to such a severe sentence? Anger against a brother is sufficient. And that involves using such insulting language that portrays a spirit of hostility where you look down upon another person as though they are no good for anything. A person who has an attitude of heart that treats 
a brother or a sister with disdain is in danger of the fires of hell. And so we ought to take heed to what Jesus goes on to say. Look at verses 23 through 26. He says, So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. In these verses, Jesus illustrates the dire importance of making things right with a brother and coming to terms of peace with your accuser. And it is worthless to worship when someone has something against you because of something sinful you did against them. And in human terms, an unsettled problem can lead to prison if your accuser takes you to court. So Jesus makes it clear that you need to leave your offering and go make things right, right away. Jesus' point in this illustration is to simply urge us to make things right quickly, because if you don't, your accuser will get justice, and you will be put in prison and not get out until you have paid the last penny. God's judgment is certain. And since justice will be served, it is incumbent upon us to do everything in our power to work for reconciliation. Wrongs need to be made right. And guys, what Jesus says here is so important for all of us to put into practice. We can't just be sinning against each other and then moving on while pretending like everything is okay. It is not okay. Jesus lays out the necessary procedure to be taken for settling disputes. If you have offended someone, then you need to go and ask for forgiveness. If you have been offended by someone, and it is building up resentment in your own heart, then that also needs to be dealt with because it is causing your spiritual life to slide into the gutter. Look, our responsibility is to do our part. If I have sinned against someone, I need to make that right. If I believe that someone has sinned against me and it has brought tension in our relationship, then I might need to approach that person in a spirit of gentleness to talk about it. Now, if nothing is resolved after talking about the issue, and perhaps things didn't go the way I wanted it to or the way I was expecting it to, I still do not want to hold bitterness in my heart, otherwise I am guilty of hypocrisy and I need to repent. What I need to do is pray for that person, treat that person with kindness, and keep a close watch on my own heart lest it becomes filled with conceit. This is the responsibility that we all have. And let me just say that as elders, we are here to support to the best of our ability and help you navigate through issues when you are struggling with what to do. We want to be there for you. But ultimately, as Christians, we all have the responsibility to be working things out amongst each other. So let me try to break this down. If you have sinned, you need to repent and plead for pardon. If someone has sinned against you, you need to have a forgiving spirit, for love covers a multitude of sins. You see, this is what we all need to be up to. We need to seek to obtain reconciliation. Aim for restoration. Pursue peace. And when there is disagreement, even strong disagreement at times, we need to pray. And side by side, we need to strive together for the faith of the gospel, because without the gospel, we all stand condemned before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, Jesus moves from the sixth commandment to the seventh commandment. In verses 27 and 28, he says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman 
with lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. According to the rabbis, the command not to commit adultery only restricted a person from sleeping with someone who was not their spouse. Now, undoubtedly, adultery includes that, but the law had forbidden much more than that, and that can be readily detected by just examining the Tenth Commandment. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, it says, You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. You know what covetousness really is? It is lusting after someone or something that is not yours. You see, when you read the first nine commandments in the Decalogue, you might think it's only dealing with external matters. But the tenth commandment, namely covetousness, re reveals that all the, of God's commands need to be obeyed from the heart. And that is what the Pharisees failed to understand. And so Jesus takes the seventh commandment and shows them th the direction to which it had always pointed. And that direction was far beyond anything that they had ever imagined. If you even look with lustful intent, according to Jesus, you are guilty. And that's not okay. Because Jesus calls for radical self-denial. In verse 29 and 30, he says, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now, Jesus isn't speaking literally here, but through graphic imagery, he is revealing the intensity with which we should be fighting against sin. And he is saying, do whatever it costs to get rid of it, because if you don't, it will cost you. Sexual sin begins with the eyes feeding the imagination. And when the eyes are fixed on that which is wrong, it corrupts the mind. And so whatever means of temptation that is used to pull you under the luring force of lust, Jesus makes it clear that we need to do everything that we can to cut it off at the very root. In 2014, at the Together for the Gospel conference, they had a Q&A session on sanctification. And there was a question posed to John Piper by Derek Thomas. Dr. Thomas asked Pastor John what he would do or what he would say to someone who can't seem to find liberation from watching pornography. And John Piper said, well, what I would say is gouge out your eyeballs or you'll end up in hell. And what Piper said reflects the words of Jesus quite well. When it comes to feeding lust, it is no game. It is a battle for your soul. We need to be actively fleeing youthful lusts and staying alert to all the seductive stumbling blocks Satan strategically deploys that, so, that can so easily entangle any one of us in a moment of weakness. And it comes in various forms. It may be suggestive movies. It may be looking at pornography on electronic devices. It may be perusing through lewd magazines. There are many avenues in our culture today that can so easily be taken to feed the lust of the flesh, and sometimes it's almost inescapable in our world. And so Jesus' words are needed more than ever. Do whatever it takes to protect your precious mind and heart from such poison. And when you stumble, plead for God's mercy and ask Him to purify your mind. Well, let's look at verses 31 and 32. It says, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. 
But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Well, this is another area where the instructions concerning divorce and remarriage had been relaxed. Now, let me say that the subject of divorce and remarriage can stimulate quite an amount of controversy because of the practical ramifications it has. They are massive depending on where one lands on the issue. And today I'm not really going uh, to get into this subject in any amount of detail to save myself. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I will be doing that once I get to Matthew chapter 19, because in Matthew chapter 19, it is dealt with at length. And so once we get there, I will try to do my best to provide for you what I think the Bible teaches on this very important subject. But for now, I simply want to point out that many of the teachers of the law had misinterpreted a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 24 that had to do with the possibility of a man writing a certificate of divorce because of finding some kind of indecency in his wife. Many teachers stretch the meaning of that word indecency way beyond its meaning and ended up allowing for a divorce for almost any reason at all. I mean, literally, a man could divorce his wife for burning his meal. But you know, people... Um, will always do what they want to justify their sin, justify their sin, and they will look for a way to stretch the word of God beyond its intention. In reality, the certificate of divorce Moses wrote about applied under a very specific circumstance, and moreover, the certificate of divorce was only given as a concession. It was an allowance that provided protection for the innocent party, not the guilty party. And it was only applicable in the case of sexual immorality. So you could see how many of these teachers had blown that verse way out of proportion by coming up with virtually any excuse to have grounds for divorce and remarriage. Well, let's move on to Os, verses 33 through 37. It says, Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord which you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Now, Jesus' words here should not be viewed as a universal condemnation of all oaths. He is really condemning the Pharisaical use of oaths because the Pharisees often use oaths for deceptive purposes. They believed making an oath would give them more credibility to their words. But since they also knew that oath-taking was so serious, they would not swear in the name of God, but rather in the things that God had made that they thought were significant, such things as heaven and earth or Jerusalem. And they would swear by those things in order to avoid God's judgment. Because to come under oath with God as your witness <coughs> meant that there would be serious consequences if the vow was not kept. The problem, however, is that swearing by anything still made them culpable because God is the creator of everything. And with all the thoughtless oaths and swearing and making vows that were being spewed out of people's mouths, it was something that Jesus needed to address with force. Now, although that is true, that is not to say there isn't any lawful use of making an oath. I mean, God confirmed his promise to Abraham with an oath. Jesus came under oath before Pilate, and Paul also made an oath. But placing yourself under an oath is something that is not normative in Scripture. It is rare and very exceptional. Oaths should only be made when the circumstances call for it, and usually it is on very solemn occasions. For example, the President of the United States 
has to make an oath that he will uphold the Constitution before entering into his presidency. When a man or a woman, or a man and a woman, get married, they make vows to each other. But what Jesus is forbidding here is a careless and flippant use of oaths in the ordinary circumstances of life and in our ordinary conversations, because when that is done, the sacred becomes mundane. And in the end, it just undermines your integrity. I mean, if you need to make an oath or a vow or swear in order to be believed, then that only reveals how unreliable you are. So Jesus said, just let your yes be yes and your no, no. Because what you say in your ordinary speech should be so truthful that it is, it is as though you are under an oath, even though you never made an oath. And anything outside of that is evil. God calls for us to be utterly honest with our words. We'll look at verses 38 through 42. He says, You have heard that it was said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. This is another instance where the teaching of the Pharisees was off course. They took a civil law that was part of the nation's judicial system and appealed to it as a justification for retaliating against evildoers on a personal level. But this was an abuse of the Old Testament, and once again, they had made a huge category error. So Jesus was not revoking the idea that justice is no longer needed uh, no, no longer needs to be carried out. He was revoking the idea that it is to be carried out on an individual and personal level. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was a principle of equity designed to restrain evildoers and punish fairly. But that was the role of the state. It wasn't their job to be going around punishing people because they were offended. No, their job was to show grace. You see, justice is to give people what they deserve. But that is the role of government, which is God's earthly institution to regulate society. Grace, on the other hand, is to give people what they don't deserve. And that is what we must show as Christians, because we are those who belong to the spiritual kingdom of God. And that means we are not to repay evil with evil, but to repay evil with good. We are to reflect the benevolent character of our gracious God. Well, let's look at the last section, verses 43 through 47. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? This final section is about our need to love our enemies. We are to reflect the loving disposition of our Heavenly Father, even to those who persecute us. Because everyone in this world either is or was an enemy of God, and yet God still showed a tremendous amount of love toward us. In verse 45, Jesus tells us that God allows the sun to rise on the just and the unjust. And he allows, or, or he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. And the point is that God's love in this case is indistinguishable. Saved or not saved. There is a benevolent kindness that God shows to all people without distinction. Now, this is what theologians call the doctrine of common grace. It is God's common grace shown to all, or God's common love 
for all people. That God demonstrates His kindness by not giving people what they deserve when they deserve it. But instead, He allows them to enjoy His creation. And He gives them families, and He gives them friends, and so on. Now, God's common love also needs to be distinguished from God's eternal love, or His electing love, because there is a special kind of love that Christ has for His bride alone. But in this passage, it is dealing with God's universal love for all people. And if God shows love to His enemies, then we must show love for our enemies. Otherwise, we are really no different than a pagan, because even an unbeliever shows love to those who love them. But as Christians, we, we must rise above that. In these six antitheses, Jesus has confronted the pharisaical misuse and relaxation of the law by soundly refuting their understanding of it and by truly showing the direction to that which the law and the prophets had always pointed. And in the final verse of chapter 5, he brings his previous teaching to a culmination and says, You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. The commandments of the law and the prophets calls for more than intellectual assent. It calls for more than just a partial obedience from a sincere heart. And certainly more than just doing your best. The standard is nothing less than perfection. And how many of us can say we have lived up to such a standard? Who here has not had anger in their heart? Who here has not had lustful thoughts? Who among us has never failed to keep their word? Who among us has never grown weary in doing good and has never chosen to retaliate instead? And how many of us can say that we have truly loved our enemies as our Heavenly Father has? Listen, if you think that you are saved by works, then you are holding on to a false hope. No one reads this sermon and honestly thinks that they are soaring. And even as believers, we need to be reminded of it again and again, because oh, how easy it is to begin striving in the flesh. But when we truly look into the mirror, of what the spirit of the law requires, as it is articulated by Jesus, we are brought to our knees. And that is a very important function of the law, even for us. We need to be brought to our knees and to stay on our knees until our knees are bleeding. Because there is a sense in which being unable to get up on your two feet is okay, if it causes you to look up and see the one who stands for you. Church, there is only one true image of the Father. There is only one true representation that truly reflects His heart and His character, and it is the one who has fulfilled the law and the prophets. The law tells you what to do, but Jesus shows you what it looks like to actually do it. And so He must be the one that captures our gaze. I love the way that the Apostle Paul put it in Romans chapter 3, verse 21 and 22. He said, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Jesus is our righteousness, and without Him we could have no righteousness at all. You know, the Sermon on the Mount has got to be the most captivating sermon ever spoken, and it sure does have a way of arresting our attention. Because what we have been called to do has already been done, and yet that which has already been fulfilled on our behalf does not take away from our need to strive for the impossible. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches what the ethics of the kingdom are, and yes, we must put them into practice. But through his teaching, he also ensures that we understand who the king of the kingdom is. And the reality of the matter is that Christ is our righteousness, and that by grace alone. But now that we are subjects of the king, he wants us to go reflect his righteousness in an unrighteous world. 
And you know, I think these two gripping truths are meant to move us to do two things that will help keep things in its rightful orbit. Since Christ is our righteousness, it means that we must rest in Christ. And since we are ambassadors for the King, it means that we must work for Christ. God wants to get us to rest and to get us running. And so even to you who believe, I say, rest in Christ and run and work for Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this amazing teaching. And Lord, as we look into the mirror, we see that we do not reflect everything it says. So God, have mercy and forgive us of our sins. God, help us to put this into practice. But God, cause our eyes to always look to the one who has fulfilled it to perfection. We thank you for Christ. And I pray that you would bless us at this time as we remember his work for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.